five seconds to submergence. Submergence deep into the absurd. Welcome to part two of the DFW, the DFW series. Um, I guess two part series, but really this is a much longer series on kind of the difference between getting sucked into the masses and becoming yourself, right? Um, kind of as a lead off from self-reliance. But anyways, I wanted to uh, start part two by kind of going back and quoting that thesis again that I said at the end of part one. So, quote, I want to convince you that irony, poker face, silence, and fear of ridicule are distinctive of those features of contemporary U.S. culture, of which cutting-edge fiction is a part, that enjoy any significant relation to the television whose weird, pretty hand has, a, has many generation by the throat. I'm going to argue that irony and ridicule are entertaining and effective, and that at the same time they're agents of a great despair and stasis in U.S. culture, and that for aspiring fictionists they pose terrifying, terrifically vexing problems. My two big premises are that, on the one hand, a certain subgenre of pop-conscious postmodern fiction, written mostly by young Americans, has lately arisen and made a real attempt to transfigure a world of and for appearance, mass appeal, and television, and that, on the other hand, televisual culture has something evolved, has somehow evolved to a point where it seems invulnerable to any such transfiguring assault. TV, in other words, has become able to capture and neuralize any attempt to change or even protest the attitudes of passive unease and cynicism TV requires of audience in order to be commercially and psychologically viable at doses of several hours a day, unquote. So, yeah, I mean, TV is like this super ironic um, kind of vacuum that sucks you in to watch it for several hours a day, right? It's it's an addiction. Um, for, for many people, it's an addiction, right? It's a drug. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it, it is a drug. I mean, you, you watch it and you do, in a sense, your physiology changes. So the the first section that he's, that uh, I'm going to start off with with this part two is the following section after he gives his thesis, which is called image fiction. Quote: Image fiction is basically a f is a further involution of the relations between lit and pop that blossomed with the '60s postmodernists. Unquote. This is, so it's essentially the merging of the real world with fiction. Um, it's like that fourth wall. It's kind of like a fourth wall break, but a little bit different. It's like painting over a painting, or perhaps more closely, painting a tree. Uh, one example is in either, I don't remember if it was an Avengers movie or an Iron Man movie, but Tony Stark, which is played by Robert Downey Jr., uh, he, he meets the real Elon Musk at a party, right? Uh, Elon Musk kind of just stands up and like, and he said like something. Um, and the viewer there subconsciously thinking, oh wow, Elon Musk as exists in this world too, right? Um, it, it almost paints the fantasy as more realistic, thus further connecting you to the TV and disconnecting you from the real actual world. Now think about just how many shows and movies today are quote unquote based on a true story. This, I think, is image fiction on steroids, right? Because, like, it's a true... Well, I mean, image fiction kind of relates to things that we all recognize. So I guess, like, maybe it's just kind of a story. But in a sense, it is image fiction because it is, like, the real world being transposed into a fiction. Wallace uh, references image fiction as not just, quote, a use or mention of televisual culture, but a response to it an effort to impose some sort of accountability on a state of affairs in which more Americans get their news from television than from newspapers, in which more Americans every evening watch Wheel of Fortune than all three network news programs combined. Reading this, one is inclined to almost laugh at Wallace at how naive he sounds here. He, he knows nothing about how the news 
in 2022 has merged into image fiction. We're now informed about world events through our entertainment. Recently, a movie came out on Netflix called Don't Look Up, um, which I personally think did an amazing job at exposing just how tied people are to maintaining an image, namely the image that everything is okay when it absolutely is not at all. This movie is the epitome of image fiction in that the viewer is immersed in a world almost exactly like their own, but without naming names. Additionally, almost all of the important characters are played by the most famous actors in Hollywood, including uh, DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, Jonah Hill, and Martha Stewart. The, the movie insinuates the idea that, oh yeah, this is, a, this is how pathetic human beings are. Acting is a full-fledged critique of modern thinking, modern politics, both of the right and left, an intrinsic, modern, repressed human desire to keep out of trouble, to avoid conflict. Um, and yeah, so, so the thing with that is like, I, I've been, you know, whenever I'm watching a show and there's a super famous act, actor or actress on there, like Jennifer Lawrence or, you know, Martha Stewart or DiCaprio or Jonah Hill, right? I'm thinking, okay, well, that's Jonah Hill. You know, and when, like, I I know, like, I can remember their name better than I can remember the character while I'm watching the show, right? Uh, and it's just kind of weird because it's like, but still I'm, like, enthralled by the illusion, right? I'm still captivated by it. Quote, and this is, this is good. <laughs> Today, when we can eat Tex-Mex with chopsticks while listening to reggae and watching a Soviet satellite newscast of the Berlin Wall's fall, i.e. when darn near everything presents itself as familiar, it's not a surprise that some of today's most ambi ambitious, quote, realistic fiction is going about trying to make the familiar strange. So that is, with everyone enacting in irony upon irony upon irony, oh, unquote, by the way, uh, with, with everyone turning the whole world into something somehow knowable and not strange, with everyone seeking to immerse themselves into the quote-unquote real world through televisual culture, smartphones, social media, etc., or otherwise illusions upon fictions upon illusions upon delusions upon irony after irony, that realistic fiction in the modern day is composed of making the feeling of strange. Because in a world where everything is familiar, it goes to show that actually none of it is familiar at all. Only the image of it all appears to be familiar. And thus, it is all quite very, very strange. And this is what Wallace says is the, quote-unquote, good news about all this. Right? So, uh, then he goes on and he says, quote, The bad news is that, almost without exception, image fiction doesn't satisfy its own agenda, Instead, it most often degenerates into a kind of jeering, surfacey look behind the scenes of the very televisual front people already jeer at and can already get behind the scenes of via Entertainment Tonight and Remote Control, unquote. So that is, the, the image fiction writer is simply further contributing to the ongoing zeitgeist of televisual culture rather than being the rebel against it. They do not see the barn, but rather... Um, people taking pictures of people taking pictures of people taking pictures of the picture of a barn that once may or may not have even existed at all. In other words, maybe the barn was built for the sake of taking pictures of it, right? Uh, uh, so um, with that said, by, by pointing out the perils of modern television and media, through modern television and media, one is almost given the viewer a false sense of justification for watching the critique. Um, TV is bad, but watching this is good because it is criticizing TV, right? Um, it, this brings to mind Netflix's, quote-unquote, The Social Dilemma, and that this documentary he heavily criticizes the algorithms employed by social media companies, yet most people heard about this documentary through these algorithms, right? Um, and w with that said, I would also go check out um, Carefree Wandering's video on The Social Dilemma. Um, just type in Carefree Wandering, The Social Dilemma. It's really good. Um, Mina sent me a link to it. That's kind of how I discovered it. And there's also, so I, I don't remember the name of the host, but he's on the Nietzsche podcast um, in one of the Keegan's Untimely Reflections, which I would highly recommend checking out. Um, anyways, so he goes on to mention how everyone on TV is pretty. He claims that pretty people are more appealing to look at than non-pretty people. 
and thus it appeals to a wider audience to have pretty people on TV. With that said, this creates a distortion of reality in that we try to identify with all these pretty, seemingly perfect people on TV, most of us real people, we, we can't identify with them, right? The world in and of itself, it's not all roses and daisies, and it's often very, very ugly, right? So Wallace says, quote, not only does this cause some angst personally, but the angst increases because nationally, Everybody else is absorbing six-hour doses and, ident and identifying with pretty people and valuing pretty prettiness more. Um, the boom in dyes aids, health and fitness clubs, neighborhood training parlors, cosmetic surgery, anorexia, bulimia, steroid use among boys, girls, um, girls throwing acid at each other because one girl's hair looks more like fair faucets than another's. Um, are these supposed to be unrelated to each other, to the apotheosis of prettiness and television culture? Unquote. And I, I gotta say, I'm guilty of this. I mean, I, I mean, I care about my my, my appearance a lot. I, I work out like six days a week for an hour when I could be spending more time writing or working on the podcast. And, like, why? Like, why do I do that? Why do I go to the gym for an hour? Like, it's so, it seems like, you know, you go and then you're, like, lifting and what? Just so you can look in the mirror and feel a little bit better about yourself? It's just, like, it's so, I mean, I guess my job is kind of just sitting by a desk for eight hours, you know? So, it's, uh... It's good to move around, but it's at the same time, it's like, you know, the, f the fact that we feel like we need to do it is like, that's just proof that our culture is just, you know, just of how fucked our culture is, right? Um, but anyways, uh, television instills an image of which Americans feel that they themselves should identify with, or at least be able to identify with. People see pretty or cool people on TV, and in their desire to relate to them, they try to be like them by modifying their body, habits, etc. That is, when, uh, when, when televisual culture tries to push a certain ideal, the masses, rather than taking pride in themselves, rather than trying to be more like them, they try to change to be like what they see. Monkey see monkey do now this is meant as more of a thought experiment um in that i mean to ask this how many things would even exist or continue to exist in the modern world today if we didn't have tv social media etc to tell us that these things exist, right? Um, again, do, does a tree make a sound when it falls if no one is around to see it, to, to hear it? It does, but we weren't around to see it, so who who gives a shit, right? Because um, it, it's like we rely on TV to know that, like, if there wasn't TV, like, how, you know, like... Sure, you'd have the newspaper, but it'd be pretty damn hard to, like, know that North Korea has, like, a nuclear bomb, or... <laughs> if there wasn't TV, we would, like, we wouldn't be as afraid, like, none of this shit would matter as much, right? Um, and I think, like, I don't think it's intent... Like, you know, people don't want to scare us, like, to control us, they just want to scare us to make money, right? <laughs> the, the media wants to scare us because it, it gives them money, because because we're more attracted to getting scared, right? Um, in a sense, that keeps us more controlled, too, right? So, now we're on to the next section, Irony's Aura. Quote, It's widely recognized that television, with its horn-rimmed battery of statisticians and pollsters, is awfully good at discerning patterns in the flux of popular ideologies absorbing them, processing them, and then re-presenting them as persuasions to watch and to buy. Unquote. 
Popular culture has the central tension of setting the nobility of individualism against the warmth of communal belonging. Um, so he, he kind of says that uh, first 20 years of television, they appealed to the group like the advertisements did. Um, however, these advertisements were still marketed to the individuals since in individuals are more vulnerable alone. Um, and I, I kind of think this is, uh, I mean, I kind of want to relate this to how psychopaths will often try to get people alone in order to like take prey upon them, like serial killers. Um, that, that's kind of what salespeople do too, right? And it's, it's also, I mean, I guess in a sense, it's also like you'll see it in movies where the guy will be like, oh, she's never alone. I can't ask her out, right? Because you don't want to ask someone out like when they're around a bunch of people, right? When you're trying to get someone to be more intimate, uh, they kind of need to be alone, right? That's what advertisements do. They try to get intimate with you because they want you to buy stuff, right? So the, the advertisements were designed to give the viewer identification with a group and thus appeal to their loneliness. But then DFW says that in the 80s, it shifted to an appeal to the individual. He writes, quote, The crowd is now paradoxically both the herd, in contrast to which the viewer's distinctive identity is to be defined, and the impassive witnesses whose sight alone can confer distinctive identity. The lone viewer's isolation in front of his furniture is implicitly applauded. It's better, realer, these soplistic ads imply to fly solo, and yet also implicated as threatening, confusing, since after all, Joe Briefcase is not an idiot sitting here, and knows himself as a viewer to be guilty of the two big sins the ads to cry, being a passive watcher of TV and being part of a great herd of TV watchers and stand apart product buyers. How odd, end quote. So this passage, it, it really demonstrates just how inherently ironic TV has become. The, the funny thing is that while the 60s and 70s marketed community and the 80s marketed flying solo, TV neither improves community or one's ability to fly solo. It merely separates one from the rest of society and connects them to the TV audience, Right. Um, so you're not being connected to people, you're not being connected to yourself, you're being connected to TV. Uh, today, with AI algorithms literally listening to our conversations, reading our facial expressions, and paying attention to the things we search on Google or YouTube, the advertisements are generally things that we already use or things that we are interested in using. For instance, I just opened up YouTube, um, and an advertisement for CeraVe moisturizing cream popped up. It's a body cream that I use to moisturize my severely dry skin, right? Um, my skin is just like completely fucking dry. <laughs> it's like, it, uh, like I get super itchy. For some reason, it's just like super dry all the time. I don't know why. Uh, I, I also have like a lot of bloody noses. Um, just because like I just get so dried out. But... Anyways, it, the ad was based on the utility and effectiveness of the cream. And in a sense, the advertisement was personalized. It told me why I should want it. However, the algorithm, it kind of already knew that I wanted it, right? Or at least that I will want it. Um, it knew that I was attracted to it. And with that modern televisual irony of advertisements lies in two things. Um, one, while we are watching YouTube or scrolling on our phones, we essentially suppress the fact that the owners of YouTube make money from us watching YouTube precisely because they are watching us watching YouTube. So, uh, two, advertisements serve more as reminders of things that we have expressed interest in in the past. The, the advertisements today tell us why we want things we already know we want and for reasons that we already know. Today, YouTube shows us advertisements of ads while using the data of us watching these ads, a product to sell to the advertising companies that make the ads. And in a sense, we are the products and we are the ones being watched now, right? And that's like, that's the weird thing. I, I can't really say a whole lot about uh, TV advertising because I don't, I haven't had cable in years. So I, I, I just use like streaming services for television and movies now, like Netflix and Amazon and stuff. Um, so, like, YouTube is kind of the only, like, you know, all those, like, social media ads are the only ones that I can really 
uh, give a whole lot of input on. So D DFW points out that once cable showed up, ads became easier to skip, so producers had to start trying to, quote, make the ads as appealing as the shows, right? So today, with ads being so easily skippable, or sometimes not even existent at all, they're more so about exposure and give options to take action. In a sense, companies gave up trying to entertain people, instead decided all they really needed to do was remind people to buy their products. So I, I kind of just thought, this is kind of just on my mind. It's like, I can't believe that cable television is like $70, and you know, you have all these commercials, and yet Netflix is like 10 or $12. You get unlimited, you get like so much shit, right? I guess it's like, you know, people like having it all be new and but it's like, you know, you're paying seventy dollars to have all watch all these freaking commu commercials, right? And it's like I I just don't see the appeal in it. Um But anyways, I he he goes on and he says, quote, Joe Briefcase might be happy enough when watching, but it was hard to think he could be too terribly happy about watching so much. Surely, deep down, Joe was uncomfortable with being one part of the biggest crowd in human history, watching images that suggest that life's meaning consists in standing visibly apart from the crowd. TV's guilt-slash-indulgence-slash-reassurance cycle addresses these concerns on one level. But might there not be some deeper way to keep Joe Briefcase firmly in the ground of watchers by somehow associating his very viewership with transcendence of watching crowds? But that would be absurd. Enter irony. Unquote. So he then goes on to say that, that art after World War II shifted from being a creative instantiation of real values to arts being a creative instantiation of the deviation from bogus values. So it's kind of art kind of became a rebellion. That said that the screenplay on TV shows substantiates this instantiation of the deviation from old values. This is especially something that's happening today. Even in politics, we see the Democratic and Republican parties trying to appeal to the uniqueness of their campaigns. Now they are overthrowing the old bogus values of the past or just of the last party, right? Um, this is like really easy to see with like the Democrats. It might be a little bit harder to see with the, the Republicans, but with Re Republicans, I'd say like theirs is, oh yeah, let's drain the swamp, right? That's a... Uh, um, or like saying like, I guess like being like an anti-masker, anti-vaxxer or whatever, um, just someone who like protests that kind of stuff. I, I guess like that would be kind of the rebellion against the old values, old values being the current values. Um, um so, so with that said, uh, th this new type, uh, are... It causes a viewer to feel as though they're doing something different and exciting. And it gives them a feeling of prideful justification for watching TV. Um, quote, unquote, that show really made me think. Um, which is something that I do sometimes. You know, I'll watch a show, then I'll be like, man, that really made me think. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, you sometimes watching a show will spark some creativity. Because you'll see something and it'll make you think, oh, wow, like, I, what if I wrote a story about... Um, this right um my uh, a friend and i were like doing like this horror like we're, we're trying to make like a horror uh sort of nft like music track or whatever that we're gonna put out on halloween i won't connect it to my identity at all but like if you find it <laughs> you might find it in us and then maybe you'll know it's me but uh yeah, we're doing like this horror thing. It's it's pretty fun. But I, but after watching like Archive 81, I've been th like I started thinking about demons and I was like, "Oh, wow, we should do like one with like a demon chant or whatever." So we're going to record it tomorrow. It's it's going to be pretty fun. But uh anyways, uh D DFW he, he mentions a Pepsi ad, which is essentially about Pepsi advertising Pepsi. And it it so like in the ad, like there's like this truck and it rolls up to a beach. And then, like, it starts, like, playing some music. And then, like, this huge horde just, like, comes over to the van, right? Um, 
So they're just advertising almost like a fourth wall break of advertising, which attracts the viewer because by showing them that the ad itself is self-aware of what it is doing, it's like almost hip and fun, right? It's just an app about Pepsi being good at advertising, right? Uh, th these tactics of, quote, heaping scorn on pretensions to those old commercial virtues of authority and sincerity, thus, one, shielding the heaper of scorn, and two, congratulating the patron of scorn for rising above the mass of people who still fall for outmoded pretensions, unquote. And this is all to get people to buy their product. Um, he then mentions that, quote, the ironic tone of TV's self-reference means that no one can accuse TV of trying to put anything over on anybody, unquote. It is sort of like a disclaimer. Um, TV has warned us that its advertisements are used to get people to buy stuff, and thus we have no right to complain. A tactic often employed by manipulating type of people is to give out surprise gifts and hold these gifts against the receiver. Um, like, oh, I, I got you this, right? Like, you're supposed to, like, obey me, right? TV, in a sense, is doing just that. I warned you, it says. A popular YouTube channel called Carefree Wandering, uh, which I mentioned earlier, it puts a disclaimer in front of their videos that states, Warning. This video is produced for attracting, attracting your attention. And to promote this channel, the platform you are using is designed to be addictive and to mine your data for profit. Wow. How dare you point that out to me, right? How wholly self-aware you are, Mr. Carefree Wandering. Uh, to, to his credit, the channel is fucking amazing and you should definitely check it out. But these sort of disclaimers are... Like, they're particularly eerie as they almost instill more guilt into the viewer. The pain from this guilt, I think, it kind of makes watching this show all the more relieving. Um, that's kind of the bad thing, right? DFW goes on to discuss the relationship between fiction and irony. Um, with, quote, as Hyde puts it, and I'm not sure what Hyde he's talking about, Irony has only emergency use, carried over time, and is the voice of the trapped who have come to enjoy their cage. This is because irony, entertaining as it is, serves an exclusively negative function. It's critical and destructive, a ground clearing, unquote. I would almost argue that most irony today is unintentional. Just because, like, um, not often we write about those things that we desire, and we often desire those things that we lack, right? The, the modern fiction writer who grew up um, in a society that is totally not rebellious and totally repressed, repressed uh, likely writes in such a way that if you're rebellious precisely because they're writing about all those things that are repressed within them. This then uh, gives the viewer a sense that they're being ironic. Um, DFW, he, he then mentions that rebellion, like rebellions and coups are great at exposing tyranny and injustice, but end up being even better tyrants, right? The, the new, the, the movement that won, like, ends up just being better at being a tyrant, right? He, he then compares irony to a sort of modern televisual tyranny, and that the ironists, when asked what they mean, almost gets angry that they were asked. Again, I think this points back to the ironists not actually trying to be ironic. Um, and I, I'm not sure if DF, DFW would agree, but I personally think that like most of the time, people aren't like actually even trying to be ironic. Like they, they ha have no idea that they're even being ironic. Um, they, they're merely repressed and feel self-conscious. In a way, they're tyrannizing themselves. Then he says, quote, What do you do when postmodern rebellion becomes a pop culture institution? Unquote. So, like, yeah, I mean, uh, this is kind of something that Mina has told me, like, a lot. What, uh, what, uh, everyone kind of becomes an Agent Smith, right? Thou shalt, thou shalt not, then thou art, right? It's a P. 
people kind of morph into the televisual culture. They kind of become it, right? They become at one with it. Um, DFW makes a statement that TV often makes itself out to be rebellious against corporations, the government, etc. It advertises all of these things, all while keeping us from actually rebelling in the real world. Um, I, I think this is one of the best points in the essay. The rebellious nature TV is, is kind of just a fan, like it's it's just a fantasy that we love watching purely because it simulates rebellion, but it doesn't stimulate it. And so that, that kind of keeps us further enslaved, right? Uh, and, and of course, like, uh, a lot of why there's not rebellion is because things are good, right? Because, um, uh, like, addicts, they'll talk about how in order to actually make change, you have to hit rock bottom. And we're just, like, at, like, America's just not at rock bottom, right? Like, we're not even close to rock bottom. And that is kind of, like, one huge issue. Um, I think unless, you know, the the glacier ice caps melt and Los Angeles and Florida are underwater, like, rock bottom's not happening for a while. Because you'll see, you know, if you watch The Social Dilemma, you see that, like, Facebook basically was used to start, like, a rebellion in this third world country. So, of course, I guess there's riots in those bigger, in, like, bigger cities. Maybe it's just worse there. I mean, I live in Idaho, so it's like, <laughs> you know, like, there's not a whole lot of shit that goes on here. It's kind of just, it's it's a pretty peaceful place to live. I mean, there's not, probably never going to be a riot here unless it starts getting a lot more crowded, but. Um, so I, I guess in a sense, I'm kind of alienated from the, like the parts of America where there's like huge riots, where buildings are getting burned and all that kind of stuff. So I don't really know what life is like in those kinds of places. But, um, anyways, he, he goes back to Delilo's barn statement and is asking of what was the barn like before it was photographed? That is, uh, what was culture like before culture was examined, uh, before culture was put on a screen in the form of television? The, the examining of culture through books and especially through TV shift the way culture is. Eventually, over time, TV becomes the culture, right? Um, it becomes a thing that's watching us, right? It, it's like entering a void that cannot be escaped, a fishbowl. Then we get to his last section of the essay. End of the end of the line. DFW asks, quote, What responses to television's commercialization of the modes of literary protest seem possible then today? One obvious option is for the fiction writer to become reactionary fundamentalists. Unquote. This is seen quite often in modern day. Many modern television shows and movies have certain reactionary political agendas, I think, um, such as the recent movie Don't Look Up, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the said reaction is that of those who have deep faith in scientists and get angry when people doubt them. Um, now, I, I'm not trying to say that it's wrong to trust scientists. It, it's obviously not. But ha having trust in scientists is important. One is to safely navigate through the world. Um, However, having pseudo-religious faith in scientists without any doubt in what they're saying, right? Like, uh, just believing in the Big Bang, like, wholeheartedly, right? Uh, which I see a lot of scientists doing today when, like, you know, at the end of the day, it's still just a theory, right? Um, uh, they, they, you know, you'll see a lot of scientists, like, using the Big Bang to prove other stuff. It's like, no, you, you can't do that, man. Like, um, you, you can't use the Big Bang to prove other stuff. Right, because that's still a theory. We need to prove the Big Bang first. Um, but, uh, but I won't get into that. Uh, it's just like having pseudo-religious faith in scientists without any doubt makes science and the scientific method ineffective since it gives little room for people to doubt or try to prove wrong certain theories. Although this phenomenon has been around for ages, right? Uh, Galileo was put under house arrest for questioning the zeitgeist of his time. Right. 
So uh, it, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, all fiction writers put messages into their works. These messages are based on the culture of their time, their personal experiences, etc. Now, if six hours of your day are spent watching TV, um, then the ideas of culture and one's personal experience is heavily reliant upon what is seen on television, right? Over time, this turns TV into a sort of echo chamber in and of itself. So he, he goes on to say that the other option is, quote, to adopt a somewhat more enlightened political conservatism that exempts viewer and networks alike from any complacency in the bitter stasis of televisual culture, and instead blames all TV-related problems on certain correctable defects in broadcasting technology. That is, it is not the view or the networks um, or the, the viewer or the networks that are behind the perils of television, but rather the medium itself. Um, DFW says that this thought was largely believed by media futurologist George Gilder. Um, DFW says that Gilder's thought was underlined by two basic assumptions. Quote, one, the discerning consumer instincts of the little guy would correct all imbalances if only big systems would quit stifling his freedom to choose. And two, tech bread problems can be resolved technologically. I can only imagine seeing Gilder on, or, or DFW, today when people have so many freaking choices on platforms. Uh, you know, I have so many choices of what platform to use. I have so many choices of what shows to watch, what things to consume. Uh, with problems that are constantly being quoted, unquote, resolved technologically, right? You know, there's all these updates all the time. Uh, the the televisual culture has only become more of a echo chamber of culture than it ever has been, right? So uh, G Gilder believed that most of the problems with TV stemmed from the fact that it was broadcasted through cables, of which not many people had the money to implement and thus, most TV was broadcasted from large, super-rich stations. None of these signals were customizable, and thus, quote, what the poor viewer gets is only what he sees, unquote. This makes it so, like, the, the limited number of programs have to appeal to millions of people, since there was so little choice between programs. And so, turning TV into something by and for heard this is kind of where you know like this is kind of the one thing that i do kind of agree with gilder is that like today uh television is kind of wittier um in, in many ways it um it kind of is because there's so many other choice so many choices now that you know like television doesn't have to appeal to a million people and has to appeal to a few people right um, and everyone's on television because it's way more affordable now. It's only like 12 bucks a month, right, instead of 60 um, if you're using the streaming services. Okay, so he, here's perhaps the juiciest part of the whole essay, um, but besides the, the farm, the, you know, like the most photographed farm, is Gilder's prediction for how much better the future will be and how free the individual TV viewer will be. Quote, for Gilder, the new piece of furniture that will free Joe, Joe Briefcase from passive dependence on his furniture will be the telecomputer, a personal computer adapted for video processing and connected by a fiber optic forever break the, out, the broadcast bottleneck of television's one active many passive structure of image propagation. Now everybody will get to be his own harried guy with headphones and clipboard. In the new millennium, the U.S. fiction will finally become ideally gop democratic, egalitarian, interactive, and, quote-unquote, profitable without being exploitive. Unquote. Yep, and he was right, but hot damn, he was dead wrong, right? Sure, the internet gives a more egalitarian and interactive approach to media, in theory, um, however, it did not actually work out that way, right? And it's not working out that way at all. It, it is more so that we now live in a society where everyone is a fiction writer 
who ogles at Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Facebook, etc., etc., uh, with everyone making their own content to advertise their life and thoughts to the whole world. It's kind of like a commodification of yourself, in a sense. And we, we advertise ourselves, right? We, we are still in the bubble. Um, and in a sense, we're even further in the bubble. And there's uh, there's kind of just more content and even stronger illusion of choice. For, for instance, while it may appear we have more options to choose from as far as what we view, we put practically no effort into this, right? The, the algorithms put in place on media platforms ensure that users are enticed for as long as possible as this ensures they will be exposed to more advertisements. And so... Uh, the, the algorithms are intended to get us to click and interact with as many videos as possible for as long as possible. We're only as free as our dopamine allows us to be. So then he goes on to say, uh, I, I think he's quoting Gilder here. I, I'm not 100% sure. But he says, uh, you, you could view the Super Bowl from any point in the stadium you choose or soar above the basket with Michael Jordan. Visit your family on the other side of the world with moving pictures hardly distinguishable from real-life images. Give a birthday party for Grandma in her nursing home in Florida, bringing her descendants from all over the country to the foot of her bed in living color. Unquote. If there is anything I've learned from the COVID-19 epidemic, it is that Gilder was absolutely correct. We do exactly all these things today. Um, sure, maybe like uh, <laughs> soaring above the basket with LeBron James is a little. I mean, with like uh, the video game 2K, 2K20, I guess you're kind of doing that. But um, the, the only difference is that it does the exact opposite of making us feel free, right? M most people, in fact, feel further enslaved by their in inhibitions because, because uh, not, not despite a modern technology entertainment, right? has only been made more addictive, more exciting, and more consuming, right? We have consumed so much media, in fact, that it has begun consuming us, right? It's, uh, we're the one, like, we're being watched, right? We're, we're being constantly watched when we're watching YouTube, right? They got all this facial technician, uh, or facial recognition software. They got these, you know, they're, like, detecting the sound that you're saying. Um, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's... It's fucked. Um, so DFW in reaction to Gilder states, quote, we will in short be able to engineer our own dreams. Then he goes on to counter Gilder with, quote, rather than a vacuous TV culture smothering in cruddy images, Gilder foresees a uh, telecomputer culture redeemed by a whole lot more to choose from and a whole lot more control over what you choose to um See, pseudo experience, dream. It'd be unrealistic to think that expanded choices alone could resolve our televisual bind. The advent of cable upped choices from four to five to forty plus synchronic alternatives, with little apparent loosening of television's grip on mass attitudes and aesthetics. It seems rather that Gilder sees the 90s impending breakthrough as U.S. viewers' graduation from passive reception of facsimiles of experience or active manipulation of facsimiles of experience, unquote. So I, I think this is spot on. The active manipulation of television has only ever led to um, an increase in how much we're addicted to it, right? Um, now everyone has television, radio, computer, etc., and all in a small rectangular cube in their pocket. It also makes us less satisfied with the experience. Um, I, I think it was like a... I, I think it's called Mind Field. It's, it's a series on YouTube. Again, I'm referring to a TV show, right? Um, but it stars Michael Stevens, which is the host of the, the Vsauce YouTube channel. Um, and there's this episode where they do an experiment on having choices versus not having choices. And when you have more choices you feel less satisfied with the choice that you make. Um, because, oh, like, I, I could have chosen that, right? 
if there's chocolate or vanilla, you're like, and you get chocolate, you're not going to feel depressed about not getting vanilla, right? <laughs> like you just aren't. But if there's chocolate, vanilla, peanut butter, you know, blah, 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 then you might feel a little bit upset. So, so in a sense, it kind of makes that uh, relapse uh, withdrawal cycle even worse. It makes it more addictive. Um, so I, I won't read or explain the final paragraph of DFW's essay. Uh, I, I guess we're wrapping up here with part two. I didn't realize how much shorter part two would be than part one because I was halfway through. But uh, um, I'll, I'll let you do... Uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of read the final paragraph of DFW's essay just because I think it's it, it's an important essay to read and it's it's more important than it has ever been today. Um, but I'm going to give a little summary. Um, so DFW is under the assumption that U.S. fiction writers who are born oglers, as in people who like to look at other people, like to stare, um, exists in a bubble that prevents much new or risky forms of entertainment from showing up on the screen, big or small. And since early TV, which I would classify as all TV before the smartphone and internet, was limited in its options, all of it had to appeal to large audiences. And so TV in those days was bland and appealed to humankind's most primal emotions. These first pushes in televisual culture made certain uh, tracks in the snow, I guess, that creators had no choice but to follow, right? After creator, after creator, after creator skied down the hill of televisual culture again and again, no one could really even imagine what the hill looked like before it was ski on, skied on, right? No one could imagine the barn before pictures were taking, pic, uh, taking pictures of it, right? Cameras were taking pictures of it. And so uh, TV, with its fishbowl effect of getting everyone sucked into its realm of thought and culture, without them even really realizing it, has the power to give millions of people much of the same thought patterns and associations, thus further limiting the amount of new or original thoughts within the zeitgeist. Uh, I, I should... Um, kind of break away here. You know, I throw around zeitgeist, and I'm not sure if it's jargon for you guys. It, it just means, uh, like, it kind of just means how things are. It's like uh, things in culture, they're constantly changing, you know? And I, I imagine the zeitgeist is a scaffolding. It is like what a, a psychology professor told me. It's like the scaffolding on a building, and the building is our culture our current science and, um, and everything. And it's all kind of, you know, we're building this thing up and the uh, zeitgeist is the scaffolding, right? It's the stuff that's kind of currently being worked on, right? Um, so with that said, uh, we're, we're getting limited the, the amount of new original thoughts within the zeitgeist, right? This likewise causes people to become so addicted to television and the ogling of culture that they become further separated and divided from their fellow human beings. After one television show, in other words, brings millions of alienated and lonely individuals who all think alike. Out of many, one. E unibus plurum, right? What adds a further layer of enslavement upon all this is just how ironic TV is. We all watch fantastic stories of people living their lives and doing things while we are just sitting down feeling guilty and ashamed that we are not being like the people we are watching, right? And as we go out into the world and work our lives away, we go to TV to escape into a fantastical other realm of reality where everything is possible and we don't have a nine-to-five job, right? Instead, we are the lone watcher of Robert Downey Jr. saving the planet from aliens with Tom Holland and Samuel L. Jackson, um, as I said, our, our love-hate relationship with TV is sort of like the marriage between cognitive dissonance and Stockholm Syndrome, right? We, we know that six hours of the audio-visual 
media day is far too much and it is preventing us from going out and doing things with our lives, right? And it's distracting us when we are actually doing things, right? Because we want to like send pictures and like show people like, hey, we're doing stuff. But it's like, dude, like <laughs> stop, right? It's a, uh, we can barely even enjoy things that we're doing because we have all these like these fucking TVs in our pocket, right? It's like, <sighs> it's preventing us from going out and doing things with our lives. Yet when we are away from it, we remember just how miserable lives are, right? And and uh, we go back to our abuser and love him with all of our heart, right? We love our phones with all of our heart. Um, in a sense, it is an endless cycle of relapse and withdrawal that Americans and today the rest of the world just can't seem to get out of. You might say, well... Who are you, a podcaster talking about philosophy on Spotify to tell me why I'm, I am being unhealthy? Well, I'm just another brick in the wall, my friend. Just another scaffolding in this ever-changing cultural zeitgeist of humankind. How ironic, right? How fucking ironic that a podcaster trying to get as many people to listen to him as possible just so he can tell you how bad it is to listen to shit as much as possible, right? In a sense, I'm, I'm like fighting fire with fire, right? Uh, and while this idiom, while it sounds cool in movies, it's like in reality, it's, you know, you can't fight fire with fire. You know, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> it's just going to make the fire bigger, right? Um, sure, eventually it goes out, but you got to fight fire with water or, or whatever the fuck firefighters use to fight fire. If I really wanted to get rid of social media, I would get rid of my podcast and go off destroying internet servers, right? I'd go all out fight club mode, right? But I'm not going to do that because I like podcasting. And I like writing. Um, I like talking to you guys, right? And I was going to leave this out, but I, I feel like I should... There's something that happened to me a few years ago. Um, I won't tell you what or what caused it, but I had this... You know, maybe I ingested something or I, uh, I, uh, I was just being crazy, but I, you know, I was, um, it was late, it was late one night in, I, I think it was early December and let's just say I ate something. I won't tell you what I, what it was that I ate. Okay. And I, uh, and I ate it with a friend. And you know, I was drunk, I was young, um, and I think it was a stupid decision at the time because I was really drunk, right? You know, you shouldn't make super drunk decisions. And then I, I started hallucinating, right? I started, uh, I was walking home with my friend wearing a poncho that I got at my other friend's house. I don't know why I was wearing a poncho at midnight in the middle of winter uh drunk but anyways we were walking back to my apartment and like I started just like for some reason I started having all these delusions and I thought that I was dead like I actually thought that I was dead and I, I was I just remember like sitting in my bathroom and I was drinking water and I just, I couldn't feel the water. Like, I felt like the water was just going straight through my body as if I was a skeleton or something. I thought, oh, I must be dead. So I went and I grabbed a knife and I thought, man, if I, 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 there's only one way to find out if I'm dead, right? I could stab this through me right now. And I, I, I just couldn't, I, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, so I, I set the knife down and I, I'm not telling the whole story, obviously, but I, I went outside 
and then I just decided, like, you know what, I'm dead, right? I, like, I, li I literally believed that I was dead, right? I just started walking down the street, and I was like, oh, I should just walk up to my parents' house, which was an hour and 30 minutes away, by the way. It felt like time was, like, moving. It felt like every second, every moment was an infinity. And at one point, I just, I had my phone in my pocket, and while I thought I was dead, I just thought, I guess I don't need this anymore, right? I guess I don't need this silly phone anymore i'm dead like what does it matter that i have this phone anymore like who cares so i just threw my phone i just threw it in the middle of the street and writing this i i won't tell you the rest of this. I, at one point i recovered my phone like a few days later because super strange i met this really like this is a true story too and it's like totally the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me i was like in the morning, I went walking down, like, the street that I threw my phone at. And, you know, I couldn't find it, obviously. And then I just started, like, asking people. And the first person I asked, like, no shit, just told me, oh, yeah, I, this a friend of mine, like, saw a phone in the middle of the street. And I'm like, oh, wow. And then he uh, got me my phone a few days later. But um, anyways, uh, thinking about this story... Um, and how, like, when I thought I was dead, I felt like I didn't need my phone anymore. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing because... <laughs> because I think we're just so repressed with death. We fear it so much. And I think that's why we do a lot of this pointless bullshit that we do in our lives. I think uh, being a living thing, it involves a lot of fear, it involves a lot of being self-conscious, involves a lot of not being able to let go, and it's, it's really hard. It, it's really hard just uh, existing in a world where you're just constantly afraid. And I think... Having that experience where I felt like I was dead, where I just felt like, oh, I, I don't need this phone anymore, it, it felt, it was so freeing. And I think in a sense, I was me dealing with my fear of death that I've been, I was repressing for ages, right? So, so again, I think uh, at, at the heart of this, you know, we're, we're afraid and, and we delve into these we delve into television because it's a distraction. It's a distraction from having to deal with these other fears that we have with our lives. Um, and obviously that's not going to stop me from watching television when I do, but I, I think it's something to think about whenever we're indulging in something is to think, well, like, why am I doing this? And I think just knowing why you're doing it, I think that can do wonders. So... Anyways, I hope all y'all have a wonderful um, week. Uh, this will probably post on a Sunday or a Wednesday. I'm not 100% sure yet. So, anyways, peace out. Take it easy.